Okay, we're going to continue working on the World War I notes. This is part two. Um, today's notes are going to be focusing mostly on the home front during World War II, or World War I. Um, what is going on in America, how we're going to pay for the war, and how the war impacts America here at home. So letter C, organizing for war. Um, the War Industry Board is created. So let's take a moment before we get into the slide to talk about the United States was a consumer economy. In other words, our factories in America were producing consumer goods, uh, dresses, shirts, washing machines, those kinds of things. And when the war starts for America, the United States government understands that we have to make sure that we stop producing consumer goods and start producing war materials, tanks, machine guns, those kinds of things, uniforms for troops. So how do we make this transition from producing consumer goods to producing war goods? And to do that, Woodrow Wilson creates the War Industry Board. He puts Bernard Baruch in charge of it. So we see in the diagram the United States government needs that we know that we need to start transitioning from consumer production to war production. And so that is the job of the War Industry Board, to oversee um, this transition from consumption to war production. And so the way they did that is the War Industry Board um, would go to mines, um, lumber companies, um, farmers, and they would allocate raw materials. They would say to these people, these mines or these um, cotton producers, look, we need you guys to sell your cotton, not to a factory that makes dresses, but we need you to sell your cotton to a factory that makes uh, uniforms. Or if we're at, we go to an iron ore place, we need you to sell your iron ore to a steel mill that's going to be selling to tank product production instead of to car production. And so the United States government is actively going to private businesses and they're saying we need you to sell your goods to these factories instead of those factories. This is certainly something that would have not have happened in the Gilded Age. In the Gilded Age, if you remember, uh, it was the business that was in charge of the government. And now in this progressive age during World War I, we're seeing that business is now telling, I'm sorry, that government is now telling business what to do. Next, the War Industry Board was also involved in manufacturing. Uh, they would go to a company that produces dishwashers, and they would say to the company, look, the United States government needs machine guns. Uh, we don't want you to make dishwashers anymore. And you know, this may be a hard sell to get the companies to do because the company could make a lot of money during World War I to all these consumers who want dishwashers. And so the government would say, look, you need to do this. Um, so we see the government, again, very progressive idea. The government's in charge. They're going to private industry and they're telling them what to produce because we need it for the war effort. Next, they are also telling manufacturers, some manufacturers, how much to charge for their goods. Also farmers, too. During a war, we always have this problem of inflation. Inflation wars are caused because the United States government goes around and they start spending lots and millions and millions of dollars uh, on the war. And so we spend a million dollars for machine guns or $10 million for uniforms. And so we see that there's the government is putting lots of money in the economy. So everybody has more money, which leads to inflation. So if there's more money out there, prices will rise because people know they can charge more for their goods. And so to keep this inflation down, the United States government will tell farmers and some manufacturers how much they can charge for their goods. They're going to fix prices. Now, of course, progressives have done this before. They did it with public utilities, and they also did it with the Hepburn Act, telling uh, railroad companies how much they could charge for their, for their services. And so this is a very progressive idea that the government is going to tell businesses who to sell to, what to make, um, and how much to charge. The government is firmly in charge. We're not in the Gilded Age anymore. Why would business do this? Why would business accept this? Well, it's not like the government is nationalizing these industries. The government is not taking over manufacturing. The government is not taking over farms. Um, and so what, why would the business cooperate? It's because the government is giving them huge sums of money to produce those, those tanks or those machine guns. And so we see that this is a progressive dream. TR would have loved this if he was president at the time. Remember, TR believed that trust could be used, that the government has good trust. And if the government has a trust, they tell the, the trust, look, pay your people more, have safer working conditions, you know, have this kind of product safety. 
this is what you can charge for your goods. These are all things that the progressives have been trying to do, but now because of World War I, they're doing it on a much larger scale. And they're doing it by able to bribe business in effect. They're saying, look to this dishwashing manufacturer. We want you to make machine guns, and the reason you're going to do what we say is because we'll give you tons of millions and millions of dollars for this contract. And so the big business are happy to cooperate. But this is a theme we're going to see in today's notes, that World War I is a progressive war. Not only are we trying to go make the world a better place and war, make it safer democracy, but here at home we're seeing that, that the World War I is going to result in this progressive idea that the government should be in charge of business. Next, what about consumers? During a war, the United States government always needs consumers to consume less. If, if, if you're an average worker and you just lived through the Gilded Age, you don't have a lot of pay, um, jobs are hard to come by, there's lots of uh, you know, competition for a job, but not during World War I. During World War I, there's very little competition for jobs because immigration goes down to almost nothing. It's dangerous across the Atlantic Ocean. In addition to that, unemployment goes down to almost nothing. There is a tremendous need for workers. Um, we need workers for not just the army, um, and so now there's a shortage of worker because the army is sucking up some of that work pool. But also we see all these factories mass producing for the war effort and, and new factories are being created. And so there is a shortage of workers, which means that workers are getting paid more to attract their labor. And so we see these consumers, they have lots of money and they want to spend that money. And they want to spend this money on consumer goods. And so dishwashers, dresses, um, you know, bread, uh, steak. Um, and so we see that the United States government, this is a problem for the U.S. government because if consumers are buying consumer goods, then factories aren't making war goods. So what can the United States government do to get consumers to consume less so that the army can then, um, you know, use the factories to produce the things that they need? And so they put Herbert Hoover in charge of what is called the Food Administration. It is his job to convince American consumers to, let's use an example, buy less wheat. If American farmers buy less wheat, um, voluntarily, um, he uses patriotism to get them to do it, um, then what will happen is the army can then use that, money, that wheat to feed, to feed their soldiers. And so we need consumers to consume less so the army can get more. And so Herbert Hoover does that. He does that by appealing to people's patriotism. What he doesn't do is he doesn't ration. He doesn't have the government physically say to, to consumers, you can only have one thing and that's it. No, he does it by appealing to their patriotism and saying, look, if we're going to win this war, it depends on you. So you should just voluntarily give up wheat on Wednesdays or meat on Tuesdays. The next thing he does, he tries to encourage people to plant their own gardens. It's called a victory garden. So here we see a propaganda poster trying to convince people to do this in their free time. Um, the reason being is if that people are growing their own food, they're not going to the supermarket, they're growing their own food, then that means that all that food that would have gone to the consumers in the supermarket is now going to feed the U.S. Army. Um, and so this is how we deal with consumers. This is how we get them to consume less. We do not ration though, right? We do not tell them that they can't consume. We just try to appeal to their patriotism and get them to voluntarily consume less. Labor. Uh, labor is always an issue for a government during war, especially a modern war. And the reason being is, if you remember a couple of slides ago, I told you that during a war there is a scarcity of labor. Um, unemployment drops to almost nothing um, because people are either in the army or they're working in factories and there are new factories opening up and so there's a scarcity of labor. So if you're a worker, you're going to put pressure on your union to go and ask for more pay. And what are they going to do? Fire you? If you ask for more pay, the factory is not going to fire you because there's not enough workers to fulfill that government contract they need of more machine guns or more bullets. And so the workers understand that they have, for once, an advantage. That there's a scarcity of labor, and in fact the factories need them more than they need the factory or the job. And so we see this as a problem for the United States government. They don't want workers to go on strike. If a worker, you know, again, this is a prime time for strikes because if a worker wants to get more pay, he just has to threaten a strike or go on strike, and um, then he'll get his more pay because the factory needs his work. But the government can't have strikes during a war. We can't have f workers who make bullets go on strike and then we don't have bullets for our troops or tanks. And so the government creates the, war, the National War Labor Board and its sole function, its primary function, is to try to keep workers happy so they don't go on strike. And they do this 
it, they do this by putting pressure on factory owners to give workers more, more pay, to give them safer working conditions, to give them shorter hours. If we keep labor unions happy, hopefully they won't go on strike, and so we don't see any you know, interruption in the supply of war materials to the United States Army. So that is, again, a progressive dream. If you remember, progressives, going back to Teddy Roosevelt, have been on the side of labor. They've been trying to help labor get better conditions. And because of the war, now the government is able to do that, but in a much bigger way. But let's say that workers do go on strike. Uh, well, hold on. Before we get to that, we'll talk about the AFL. Some unions will take no strike pledges. That's what they call them. The American Federation of Labor is one of those unions. They say, look, we're patriotic. We want America to win the war. So during the course of the war, we will not go on strike. And this is relatively easy for the AFL to do because they represent skilled workers who are already getting more pay than anybody else. And so this is easy for the AFL to do. But if you're a union that represents unskilled workers, you're going to go on strike. You're going to do that because this is a prime time for your unskilled laborers to ask for and have the upper hand in getting more pay. So we do see that unions are protesting the war um, because, well, they, they want to go on strike. Now, the government doesn't want them to do this. And so we see two things that the government does. The first thing is the government will do pass a law. It's called the work or fight rule. And what that means is if you're in a key industry, let's say you're producing machine guns or the railroad industry, um, we don't want to let you go on strike. And so not only are we going to try to end strikes by encouraging businesses to treat you better, but if you do go on strike anyway, as 6,000 unions did um, during the war, what we're going to do is we're going to just automatically draft you. It's called the work or fight rule, and it is trying to get workers to not go on strike. And so we see that the National War Labor Board has what we call a carrot and stick approach to labor. The carrot is the reward. Look, don't go on strike because, you know, we're trying to help you get better. We're trying to force factory owners to give you more pay. And if you do go on strike, the stick approach is we will force you to go fight in the war. Um, we will also persecute you. We'll send you to jail because you're not supporting the war. Um, and so we see that the National War Labor Board, this is how they try to deal with, un with unions and, and labor during the war. They're not all that successful. About 6,000, like I said, unions will go on strike in the war, and that is harmful to the war effort. Also, we're going to see that a whole new group of workers will enter America, but this time not from another country, but from the South. And they will work as replacement workers or scabs, and that does weaken unions because when they go on and strike, um, we will see that the, the factory is able to continue working because they get all these replacement workers coming up from the South. We'll talk more about that later. Paying for the war. Uh, wars are expensive, um, and so how does a nation go about paying for a war? They could just print more money, but that's bad. It causes inflation. Um, they could also raise taxes, but that's bad too. It, make wor it makes workers' pay go down um, because they're losing more in taxes, which would, could cause more strikes. And so the best solution to pay for a war is just to borrow money. The United States government will borrow about two-thirds of the cost of the war in the form of bonds. A bond is when you loan the government money. Now, that's not easy to get people, to convince people to give up their money to support the war. And so we see the government launch a propaganda campaign with posters like we see in the top right-hand corner. It says, beat back the Hun. The Hun is the German who is drawn to look like a, a, a menace, a monster, bloody. Um, he's defeated Europe and he's now coming for America. So beat back the Hun with liberty bonds. Loan the government money and that'll help us win the war. And that is how the government pays for most of the war. Of course, they do raise taxes some. We do have a progressive an amendment, the 16th Amendment, so we do have an income tax, the Revenue Act, and that will be a graduated income tax, and that will help pay for the war by raising taxes. The, high, the more money you make, the more money you pay, up to a 65% top tax bracket rate. So if you're some of the richest Americans at this time, you are paying a pretty staggering 65% for your, of your income. This is progressive. If you remember, the progressives wanted a graduated income tax. They thought this was a way of lowering the wealth gap. So once again, we see that, that World War I certainly is allowing the progressives to do things they've always wanted to do. They can just do it on a bigger scale now because they can say it's for the war effort. Number five, raising an army. Of, uh, this is not a very popular war, and so remember Woodrow Wilson had to convince people to buy war bonds or to support the war effort with his four minute men, um, and so we have to resort to the draft. So that it makes the war even more unpopular. If you're going to force people to go to the war they don't want to go to, it's going to make the war more unpopular. However, in this war, unlike the Civil War, um, we see that if you're rich, you cannot hire a substitute. You cannot hire somebody to take your place. 
The only people that were going to be excluded from the draft are people in certain key industry jobs, jobs like uh, steel manufacturers or train workers or policemen or doctors. Um, these are the people that we say, look, we need them in society so they won't be able to be drafted, but just about everybody else can. Next section, social changes caused by the war. This is primarily what AP usually cares about when they talk about a war. Yes, the battles and the sacrifices that are made there, but they're also focused on how the war is going to change America. And one of the biggest changes is to African Americans. Now, as I said in a previous slide, African Americans are primarily before World War I, the African American experience is a southern experience and a rural experience. They're still sharecropping, they're absolutely poor, and they're suffering discrimination um, by segregation um, and the Jim Crow laws and Plessy versus Ferguson, all of that is going on in the South at this time. And so if you're an African American, you don't want to stay in the South. You want to get out of where you see all of this racism and segregation and go someplace else. So that's one reason so black Southerners move out. But another reason is because African Americans are tempted to move North because there are all of these government jobs up North in the form of, not government jobs, I'm sorry, factory jobs. All of these factories are popping up in the North to supply the United States government with its war materials. And these are high paying jobs, certainly higher paying than what they were getting as a sharecropper. And so we see millions of African Americans move North um, to, into these Northern cities like Detroit, Chicago, and New York, and it's called the Great Migration. It goes from 1916 and it will continue even after the war all the way up until 1930. Now, not all Americans up in the north are happy about this migration. There's going to be lots of white um, lower class people who are very upset about this migration. They see African Americans come in, move into their neighborhoods. That doesn't make them happy. And they also see African Americans be used as replacement workers or scabs when they go on strike. And so there's an economic reason as well as social reasons we see that we, we're going to see lots of violence between white workers and African Americans who have moved north. The most famous example happens in 1919 in Chicago. Um, in at Lake Michigan, which is next to Chicago, there was an African-American kid and they were just playing in Lake Michigan um, and they had noticed that they had drifted over into the all-white section of the beach. Um, some white people saw this, they dragged the kid out and they beat him up. And then this will spark riots all throughout the city as white mobs will go throughout the city, taking out their frustration on African-Americans when they see him. Certainly we see that in this picture of this unfortunate African-American who has been hit by a brick and he's bleeding um, and the police are just now coming to help him kind of after the riots are over. Um, and so we see, we're, go we're going to see lots of friction between, North between white Northerners and African American Southerners who have come up for those, for those factory jobs in the 19 teens and 20s. Women are also going to be impacted by the war effort. Um, since there's so uh, much a scarcity of labor, the men are away. Besides African Americans, women are going to increasingly leave the home and go work in these factories. Uh, they are high paying jobs, they're usually jobs that are reserved for men, but now the men are gone and so we have some very physical, tough jobs that women are going to start to go into. Now of course we have seen women in factories before, we've seen women as teachers, but um, the amount and number of women that are going to go into these factory jobs increases. So now they have more pay. We'll see this in the 1920s when women have all of these jobs and all of this pay that they've earned or that they've saved up. Now they have economic freedom and that will lead them to change their behavior. Since they now have their own money, they don't have to listen to men. And so we get what is called flappers, young women who are more rebellious, who don't have to listen to, the, to men, they don't have to do the cult of domesticity. We'll talk more about that when we get to our 1920s notes, but we'll see that World War I is certainly changing women. They're having more careers outside the home, more economic freedom, which leads to more social freedom. When the, war, when the war is over, lots of women are expected to go back and rejoin the cult of domesticity, and some absolutely do. But if we compare women in the workforce before the war to women in the workforce after the war, women are going to stay in the workforce to a much higher degree than they were before. In addition to that, women are also going to have their lives changed by the war because they're going to get finally suffrage, the right to vote. We have, we have long wanted women to have the right to vote. There was Susan B. Anthony and her suffragettes before the Civil War, and now we have Elizabeth Cady Stanton um, 
after the civil after the world war uh, I'm sorry the civil war and you know we've talked about how women are changing tactics in the gilded age and the progressive age to try to get the vote and so this has long been a progressive dream to have women have the right to vote but now we can say that it also is a, is something tied to the war Woodrow Wilson says look with these women they helped work in factories to supply troops with the machines and the weapons we needed to win the war and so we should reward them they are just as much responsible for winning this war as anybody else and so Woodrow Wilson is going to use the war as an excuse or as a reason to give women the right to vote and so here again is another progressive dream come true that not only is the government in charge of business um, but now the government is also helping give women the right to vote and so once again it's a progressive dream women's lives are certainly changing as a result of the war prohibition it's another progressive idea um, that is going to be helped by World War I. We have long talked about the need for temperance or the desire for temperance, that alcohol causes evil in the cities, it causes absenteeism at work, it causes spousal abuse and child abuse, people to lose their jobs, poverty, crime. And so we have seen progressives try to outlaw alcohol before, but now we can able, finally able to outlaw alcohol with the 18th Amendment because we say it is tied to winning the war. It's a war measure. If we get rid of alcohol, we can win the war because alcohol is made to a large part by grain and instead of having that grain go to supply alcohol which we don't need it can go to feed the troops which we do need and so we can now convince Americans that we need to get rid of alcohol because it'll help us win the war in addition to that if we get rid of alcohol soldiers won't be drunk on duty so it's another here's another reason it'll help us win the war and so the 19th amendment women's right to vote and the 18th amendment prohibition both progressive ideas and they're both going to get passed because of not only of progressivism but because because of it's tied to the war. So when we come back, we will finish our notes, part three of World War I, talking about the war itself and the end of the war, the Treaty of Versailles.